Um, we're going to look at a lot of code, but it's mostly JSON or PowerShell. Um, and I'm going to explain why we've made a lot of the de decisions that have got us this far. And um, yeah, that's, that's a good summary of what we're going to cover. Uh, there is a session, I think tomorrow, uh, where he's also going to go up onto DSC v3, but he's going to be more of a how to write your own modules. Um, and then Jeff Hicks has a session later in the week on basically DSC leading up to v3 and anybody who wanted to use it as it is shipped in Windows. So anything you want to know about DSC this week, you probably can get out of a session. If not, just catch me in the hall and I'll explain anything you want. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll explain before I get to why that right now DSC v3 is in an alpha stage. We were hoping to be code complete by the end of March. We had a bunch of new work come in for other stuff, so we had to delay. We're really close. Um, out of the things I can demo today, um, I'll explain it as I go, but there's a few things that are working, but we're, I know there's gonna be big changes coming, so I didn't fully finalize uh, some of the adapter logic and stuff like that to get there. You'll see what I'm talking about as I go. Um, but, uh, most of what you're going to see today in demo is sitting in my PR for Steve Lee uh, to review. So there could be more commits tomorrow. <laughs> and so you'd want to build it off of my PR if you wanted to get the latest version. Uh, so you're literally seeing this work in progress. Uh, cool thing about DSC v3 from almost the very beginning, there was very little that happened uh, before. Uh, we're doing it open source from the very beginning. So you can see every commit, you can see the entire issues list. Even if you don't want to do the builds and run the commands yourself, a lot of the stuff in the issues list can just use like plus one votes, like managing reboots. Yep, that's important. You know, plus one or leave a comment. That's a big deal that helps us understand that we're working on the right things. So um, this is just the, the, uh, the common location where we're managing the project. I think we can get to code complete within the next couple of weeks. Um, and hopefully by PSConf EU, we'll be able to do um, a little bit more of an end-to-end -end story, and Steve Lee will be doing that demo. So uh, let's start with why even do a V3? Like, isn't DSC dead? <laughs> do you do Twitter? Um, so it's not, and we are using DSC all over the place at Microsoft. Uh, I want to show you one thing really cool that came out at Build. So if you have a Windows 11 machine and you type dev home, I don't know if this will, PowerPoint will try to stay on top. So you might be asking what the heck is this and why are you showing it to me? Um, we are doing a lot of partner work with the uh, developer division. This dev home concept, they came to us and said, hey, we're building like a developer dashboard for Windows 11. And one of the big things we're trying to figure out is like if you go look at a project in GitHub, how would you know that you're using the same tools as the people who are working on the project so you kind of get continuity? So they had this idea of a machine configuration view. And you know, one option is set up local machine and you can come out here um, and pull it from a repository. If I hit cancel, I go back. Um, and then there's install applications. I can go in here and say, you know, I want PowerShell 7, I want VS Code, I want Windows Terminal, add to the list, hit next, next, finish, and it installs everything for me. And then there's this concept of configuration file where you just browse for a YAML file, it ingests it, and then it basically just goes through the list and installs all the applications as if you had picked from here and, and did it that way. This is just using DSC. So this is a good example of what we're trying to accomplish by reaching out to tons of different partners within Microsoft to say, instead of trying to win all the hearts and minds to, to go and use DSC by authoring their own code, what can we deliver as a full end-to-end -end solution using supported resources where quite frankly, like the developer community doesn't have to go embrace DSC, they just get an experience that they wanted and it uses DSC under the hood. So this is where we're seeing a tremendous amount of growth in DSC and, and there's a bunch of other stuff going on in DevDiv. Um, but across Azure, uh, machine configuration is the service where there's unreal growth of DSC happening. Um, 
And then obviously Azure Automation and the DSC extension still exists uh, and a handful of other places where we're still seeing it. One of the big things we wanted to do for DSC v3, um, v1, v2, as you all know, tightly cupper, coupled into Windows, including like the, the get DSC resource, start DSC configuration are tightly coupled into WMI. You've all seen like, oh, I didn't, I didn't run WinRM quick config, so I can't do something. Um, so we wanted to move to a completely native code implementation, but have PowerShell be the um, first thing we focus on for resources. So not rely on WMI, not rely on WinRM, be able to do something uh, cross, completely cross-platform without having to integrate with OMI, which isn't supported anymore for Linux, and be able to do um, more than we could before, but completely native code with full compatibility for the original set of resources. So we set our goals pretty high. Pretty high. Um, we've had the idea for several years. What if we decoupled the way we run a resource and the resource itself? So we started thinking about this for machine config a few years ago that was like, well, instead of having people write just the PowerShell resource, what if we started with a JSON file that said forget, I always do that, it's not forget, it's for the get method, and then for the set method, and for the test method, tell me what executable you want to run, and then the arguments, so if it's PowerShell, tell me what version of PowerShell, and frankly, if you want to run a native command, or if you want to write your resources in Python, let's not stand in your way, you just give us a manifest, it says this is how to run it, and then you've got your automation artifact to the side. So that was a big part of the first idea was, um, it should be easy to author, and then basically anything should be able to be used as a resource. Uh, and then we had a, the tons and tons of feedback on, you guys gotta get rid of MOF, you gotta you know, like work towards a more uh, cloud native solution and things like that. Um, so, this would be our ultimate goal. So this is a bicep file. Um, I think we would land this first in JSON as, as an Azure Resource Manager template. We would work uh, towards being able to do this natively in Bicep and possibly even beyond that. Uh, and certainly we would want to extend this concept to other clouds, but I wanted to paint the picture. You can see I set the uh, API version to 2029 just to indicate that this is not real. Um, that is the day that I will turn 50, so that's the API version. The idea would be if I deploy a VM in the cloud, I shouldn't have to take how I'm going to configure that machine and all the automation scripts that get me there and like put that somewhere else in a zip file that I have to figure out how to get access to and all that kind of stuff. I should be able to put that right in my configuration. Now maybe I've got like some hugely complicated scenario and it still makes sense to push that out into a separate artifact that I manage independently. Could be. But if it's just a simple thing, I should be able to put that right into my deployment script and not have to think about all these different things happening. Uh, so you would see here that the idea would be in my assignment, I say that I want it to apply, I want it to autocorrect, maybe I put the timing and things like that in there as well. Uh, and then for the resource type, I'm going to everybody's old favorite, the file resource, and just saying, go create a file and put this text in it, right? And as simple as that is, that is not easy to do today. Uh, after we've been trying to figure this out for how long? So that's the level of simplicity that's our goal at, at, to, to try to reach, um, to see if we can get there. So the majority of this session, I'm gonna spend uh, walking through this list. We're just gonna go one by one. It's gonna be uh, boring if you don't like reading code. <laughs> um, not line by line, I just kind of pulled the snippets up to explain what are these things and how do they work so you can get a feel for what's new. If you have questions along the way, just Raise your hand, I'll probably repeat them so they can hear them in the recording and, and we'll just roll through it. So let's start with adapters. The idea of an adapter, I, I, I sorted these alphabetically and I, I don't know if that makes sense chronologically or not, but here we go. Uh, the idea of an adapter is that is the JSON manifest that tells DSC what to go run. So you can see in this one, and, and the nice thing is if you go look at the project, there is a published schema definition for each of these concepts. So whenever you go into something like VS Code and you're doing the editing, IntelliSense just figures it out as you go. It says, oh, you're gonna need these properties, here's the validated set for each of these values and all that kind of stuff. So that works really well. Um, so in this case, 
the adapter type is Microsoft DSC, which is the namespace that we're going to reserve for the stuff that we're shipping in DSC v3, uh, and it's slash PowerShell. I also have one checked in for slash Windows PowerShell, which means you can control uh, both in the resource when you write it and when you call DSC, depending on how you want to do it, and tell it, I want you to run this in PowerShell 7 or PowerShell 5. Because as we've all seen, some stuff is different in 5 and 7. And even if it works in 7, it might be using implicit remoting, and the deserialization gets your output all screwed up. So the ability to say, I've got one config, and on an item-by-item -item basis, I want to tell DSC, use PowerShell 5 or use PowerShell 7, and give you that control as you go through it. Uh, so in this case, it's, it's slash PowerShell, so that's indicating 7. And then um, what you would see if you were to look, and we can go look at the GitHub repo if you'd like, but in this case, under the type adapter, uh, as an example, this is the list operation. So when you run the equivalent of get-dsc resource and it lists the available resources, what you're looking at is it's saying call pwsh, pass in these command or these arguments, and then run this script and pass it the parameter list. And that ps1 file is just a script that has, what you'll see in v3 is in addition to get, set, test, we also have list, validate, and export, which we'll get into. Uh, but list is the operation that says, I want to return all the things that this thing knows, so guess what it runs? Get DSC resource. And if it runs it in seven, you get one list, and if it runs it in five, you get a different list. And we control that by looking at the properties of the module that says, what additions of PowerShell do you support? Um, so there's all kinds of things that we can do to build upon this and, and make it super, super powerful. Um, I think I have two slides on this. I do, good, okay. <laughs> uh, the other part of adapters besides solving PowerShell versioning is the concept that anything should be able to express itself as a resource. Our hypothesis is that from about now going forward, most command line tools have the option to express JSON as the output format. And you've seen that in like KubeCuddle and AZCLI and the Amazon resource, like everything has uh, you know, dash dash format or uh, dash dash JSON as a way to say output to JSON. Well, in DSCB3, we needed, because it's not running a PowerShell commandlet where you can pass objects down the pipeline, we needed a way to standardize input output between the, ex the DSC.exe executable, which is written in Rust, and everything else in the world. So we just standardized on JSON. So it's receiving JSON uh, as input to DSC that gets fed into the parameters of the resource, and the resource feeds JSON back out, which is great for PowerShell because PowerShell is awesome at working with JSON. It feeds that JSON back out, DSC interprets it, and, and hand, knows how to handle the orchestration. In this case, uh, what I was playing around with, failed miserably, I'm gonna submit a PR and figure out how we can do this, was, okay, well there's a command in Windows called date, what if I just wanted to do DSC resource get and have it return the date of, of the current machine? And you'll see why, a little bit why that might be interesting. Can you control it by date there? It's, uh, yes, that would be a problem, but that's not the actual bug. Uh, it's because date doesn't return JSON. So I'm gonna have to, we're, we've got a bunch of ideas on how we could do this. One would be maybe we just need an adapter for CMD I would find that really like satire and probably use it for demos to have an adapter that says, here's how you run uh, batch files. Um, and we could just echo out a JSON wrapper for whatever these things implement. If there's a need for that, this is so adaptable we could do it. And that's kind of what makes it cool. It's more likely what we'll do is some sort of like a generic capture that says, uh, have a property that's like wrap with simple JSON equals true, and we'll just take whatever the output is and do result equals and capture the string output. So a bunch of ways we can figure this out. We'll ask for feedback, see what the right way to do it is. But the reason I wanted to present this was to say, there's a bunch of things out there that might not even need PowerShell resources. Um, so the, the, there's a great demo happening tomorrow where he's using tzutil.exe, and he just wrote a wrapper that handles the JSON input output and did a time zone utility and never wrote any script. He's literally just calling tzutil.exe and handling the input output. Uh, that's the idea of it should be simple enough that anybody can do it without being intimidated and it should be flexible enough that anything can be a resource. Um, and, and then I think we would get 
more people who are doing cloud deployments to consider it as an option because the hurdle uh, what you all probably have experienced is like, how the heck do I even get started writing a resource? And then everybody uses the script resource. And the next adapter that I'm gonna, I've done PowerShell, I've done Windows PowerShell, the next one I'm gonna work on is just a script adapter. So what that would look like is get, call PWSH or, window, or, or PowerShell DXE depending, and just run get.ps1. And then set would be mapped to set.ps1. And the idea was kind of like in the script resource where you copy and paste your script into get script, set script, test script, and then you have all the problems. Well, it's not signed, and then uh, how do I write unit tests because these aren't like atomic scripts and things like that. If we can move those out to just standalone scripts, then we get the flexibility we want, we get the simplicity we want, uh, and also, we could do that in Bash, we could do that in Python, we could do that in Go, we don't really care at that point, it's just run that script at, at the, in fact, if you wanted to have a, fun, a funny adapter that said I want get to run PowerShell and set to run Bash and test to run Python, it shouldn't really matter. That's the level of abstraction that we're kind of going for. So that is adapters. Any, any thoughts or questions about adapters before I move on from that? Yes, sir? Does it replace a resource? Does it replace a resource? Um, it becomes the glue between dsc.exe and the resource. So it itself is a resource that just enables nested resources would be the way to think about it. Sir? Would people be able to write their own adapters? Yes. So the question was, would people be able to write their own adapters? And 100%, yeah. That's, that's the way we're thinking about it. In fact, um, we're playing, not playing around, <laughs> it sounds funny. We're partnering very closely uh, with several teams. Uh, one of them is the Power Toys team. Um, they've been looking at, uh, could they recommend a best practice where things like setting in Windows actually um, are pre-built executables intended for this purpose? So they know they have to output JSON. They know they're gonna have a simple set of parameters. Uh, they've, they've got, uh, DSC resources out there now, I think. Um, hopefully I'm not stealing their thunder, but if I am, Clint will forgive me. Um, but that's the idea is we, we would like to find more people to partner with that are thinking upstream a little bit to saying, instead of having an application and then a PowerShell resource that wraps the configuration of your application, why don't you just build that configuration capability right into your application? So be able to run thing.exe space config space whatever and have that manage the settings. Will we ever get there completely? Absolutely not. That's, that's a lofty, lofty goal. But if we can capture some hearts and minds and kind of get that pattern rolling, I think that that would be um, a really, really simple way to handle things. So assertions. Uh, the concept of assertions, once you get this, it's like the simplest thing, but it's totally lacking from DSC v2. Uh, so the idea was for assertions, what if before I have my resource run set, I just wanna check to see what this environment looks like. And it's literally just a check. So I want to assert that I am on server 2019 and later. Or, so imagine you've got one configuration script and you say, do these steps if you're on 2019 and later, but these other steps if you're on 2019 and uh, newer. I don't know if I got that right, but before or after, right? Before, you had to sort that out in your PowerShell script so that at compile time, it would figure out what version of Windows am I running on and produce the right MOF file. The goal is to just have one JSON or YAML file where you tell it, if you're on this OS, do this. If you're on this OS, do that. An assertion really is just a resource. It's just that you're telling DSC a different way to use that resource. Tricky thing is gonna be, it's not really tricky, but uh, it, an evolution that we're gonna have to work out is really honestly, like in V1, we didn't even use get, and in V2, we barely used get. So a lot of the resources that are out there, get is not super well implemented. So I imagine that most of the things used for assertions are gonna be new-ish resources because we'll spend more time telling it how to have the get method return the right level of detail so that you can have an assertion that's, that's reliable. Because a lot of the time, I mean, I know I was guilty of this too when we were first doing DSC resources, it's like, well, 
if we're only using set and test and get is just like for decoration, then um, fine, just put something in there. Right? Um, so the idea here that you're seeing on the screen is uh, first there's an, well, there's an assertion here which is calling the assertion adapter, which knows I don't care about set or test. Well, actually, I, I only care about test, sorry, um, which is going to rely on get in some cases. Um, go check the registry, see if system root is on a Z drive. If it is, then set this example to present is the workflow we're looking at there. Export uh, largely came from M365 DSC. So if you've seen that, uh, M365 DSC was originally developed by the Microsoft field as a way to say um, somebody wants to test something in SharePoint. So let's run a script that uses DSC and runs get across known things in a SharePoint farm, pulls them all out, creates a, 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 a configuration script, and then I can go offline where there's no impact, deploy that same SharePoint farm, run all my tests, if it, when, I, when I get it right, then I can bring it back to production. So it's like cloning. And what they discovered is that it works really well if you know exactly how to build the thing that you're trying to clone. So the problem is SharePoint's a good example. I need to install Windows, I need to join it to a domain, I need to install SQL, I need to install these dependent things, then I can set up my farm, then I can set up the sites, like all that stuff has to happen chronologically. Um, so what, where, where, they, they definitely have uh, expressed requirements and are pushing us uh, on this, which is great. It's exactly what we need to say, I need an export capability. Nick's actually been asking for this for like years. Uh, he's always said, we need a fourth, a fourth method called export. So get, set, test, export. Um, the, the first place where we'll do this, uh, if you remember like the dev home thing, would be, can we just look at stuff like Winget, because Winget already has a DSC resource, and say, um, for this resource type, go find all of the known entities and return that as a config. So if it, it, it'll work really well for something like package. We've got a package manager. We know how to call it. That thing can output a full list of what's installed on this machine if it knows about it, right? So you could say export type, and then you tell it your package manager or uh, additional, you know, what, what websites are configured in IIS, stuff like that. It's a known thing. And you could say, okay, all those things. What you wouldn't want to do is export the file resource. That would not make any sense at all. Like, Give me a configuration that would replace every single file across this operating system, or registry, or WMI. That would be horrible. Like your script would never stop getting generated, right? Uh, so there's things that are just naturally not going to fit. Now there probably is a thing that's more like, I want to export these hundred files. They're you know the details of where they're stored and their contents because then I can duplicate something that's on a machine to somewhere else. So some of those scenarios might start to make sense, and in that case, we would uh, need more than just export type. We would need export type with some details about specifics. So we're still working through that. But you get the idea that this, this is a real scenario. Um, it, it's, a, it's exposed in dsc.exe today, uh, and, and it'll actually be the next part of the PowerShell adapters uh, that I'm helping work on. Um, functions. If you've written an ARM template, you have seen functions already. In fact, a lot of you probably have seen this in JSON in general, and this was super hard to do in uh, V1 and V2, and it was a really common request. And here's, so, so I'll, I'll explain how to do it, and then I'll explain the scenario that makes sense. So in this example, you're saying, uh, I just want to write the output of what operating system am I running? So for the resource, it's OS info, and it's running, um, the test, and you can see under output, uh, the, the output of the echo resource, so it's just running the echo command, is referring back to the OS info resource above it. I guess I could use my mouse cursor. So the echo command, the echo command, it would have to be implemented in the resource, uh, is first calling OS info, looking at its output, and it's saying when you get, when you write the output, Concatenate this string. The OS is refer back to the OS property coming from Microsoft slash OS info. 
and then go get actual state.family. So um, actual state.family would be downstream properties of the OS value returned by the OS info resource. That seems like you're just doing a lot of string parsing. The actual scenario for this kind of stuff is like, I'm gonna deploy a database. I don't know the connection string to that database until after it's deployed. Then I can deploy my web server. And when I deploy my web server, I can tell that website how to talk back to SQL. But I don't know what that is until I've generated it. And people have asked for years, can you have one resource output to the next? And they're like, nope, <laughs> this is like it's in a MOF. It does this, 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 this. So this concept of functions through the you know, ideas like string parsing and capturing output and being able to refer to output and bring it forward really starts to fulfill that data flow input output across resources. Right now this works, I'll get to groups next I think, uh, within groups and then one group can refer to the next. We're looking at like being able to, to do nested reference calls up and down the stack and stuff like that as we go through configurations. So, yeah? <laughs> yeah, um, I get it. Are we really going to go back to programming in data languages? Because that sucks. <laughs> I'm sorry, like, why can, can you just give me a way to call that thing a PowerShell script and let me write a PowerShell script instead of writing a YAML file with scripts in it? We need some way to refer back to the previous sure. output. So pass, give me the ability to use that. Like you, you got oh, just, just as input? And pass that object into... Just take the whole JSON? Give, me the, give it to me as an object that you can use. What if we, for, for, maybe it's just a bad example, like what if a parameter input for this one was literally just reference resource ID property thing? and kind of take the string concatenation out of it. Make it less, I just, like I said, the, the problem with ARM JSON, the reason why we have by step is because debugging this is impossible. That's an interesting one, okay. You can't break point on it, you can't inspect it. All you can see is output, and so you end up writing 14 lines of, yeah. of different output to see what everything is, so you can just tell what went wrong. Why did I not get what I thought I was gonna get? Yeah, I mean this is that's imperative. that's a really tricky part. Yeah, whenever you whenever you flow output to input, it's it's uh, you, you're Murawski and I sat and argued about this at camp one time, and and his uh, opinion was as long as you always get the same outcome, it's still declarative. I don't know, I'm probably in the middle somewhere. Um, I think this is a good one. I'll, I'll create an issue on this and tag you in it because we should keep keep that going. Well, this is technically YAML. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but it's, but I, I follow you, yeah. I follow you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I follow you. Yeah. So now we, we have a bicep, but then here is a mismatch. We have everything that we are getting back in a very rare way. JSON templates, and that's not good. Is the issue flowing across resources or just the language? For me, it's two things. One is that you've embedded this code in a string, which. Yeah, that I could clean out. Right. I just pulled this because it was our Pester example. Yeah, yeah, no, but you know what I mean? Yeah. There's code in a string, that's one problem. Yeah. That's the hard part, yes. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, if you can provide authoring mechanisms that sites cannot look at this, that's right. Do something nice and nice, you can't, it could yes. be created by this kind of thing, I don't care. You can't see it in source code, yeah. I didn't care before for mock files, yeah. because mock files are full of images as well, like no one expects me to open empty notepad and start writing mock files. That's right. 
That's how I feel about taking the class. <laughs> if you seriously, I'm, I'm gonna hold on. Let me let me let me go over here and come back. That's my next question. Yeah. I was just should should we do have a bicep maybe extension? Right bicep instead of this. Okay. And in fact, I would suspect that if you ship this, somebody's going to make a way to write bicep. Yeah. Yeah, we we've sat down with their team. We just got to build the extension to make it work. That's really good feedback. Yes sir. This is the, this would be the config. Yeah, but like actually how you would be doing yeah. writing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So you can, so you can, you can actually write it in YAML or JSON, either one. It doesn't really matter. Um, and we will, we. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We 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 also do handle parameters, but I think I'm following you on a different. Yeah. So your. Yep. Yep. That's a good one you should explore too. So we, we are supporting parameter files in the same way that uh, like for ARM deployments, you can do a parameter file separate from your deployment file. Um, that might help with the readability of passing from one resource to another because you could go back and look at the data file. Um, but still, let's start an issue in GitHub because I don't wanna lose the feedback we're getting here, but also as we all have more time to chew on it, uh, we'll we'll take it further than just what we can answer here. But um, I want to get your GitHub ID so, before I leave, so I can uh, tag you in that, or at least send it to you. Groups is a similar concept, so I'm curious on your feedback. Not not similar concept, but the idea was um, I need to keep a set of resources together. So I've got. These things can happen, and these things can happen. Uh, before, we've always had those complicated depends on statements that's like, this one depends on these three, and then the second one depends on just the bottom two and those kind of relationships. The concept of a group started with, these three need to run, they can have dependencies within themselves, but like not until that whole group finishes should this other set of resources run. And it could be an individual resource depends on the group, or a group depends upon a group. As we've come along, we've started finding more and more scenarios to the point where uh, it, it'll often come up like with a new challenge, can we solve this? And we've just said, actually, I think I can do that as a uh, creative use of a group instead of needing a, a, a new capability in DSC. Um, and so you'll see some examples of that. But a, a group is just another resource type that knows uh, a special capability, which is to uh, associate a list of resources. Which takes me to this one, <laughs> which is one of the group types is parallel. So I could say, here's four resources, go run those in parallel. Once that group finishes, now I can move on to group two, which needs to happen in order. So that's an idea of an introducing a different type of grouping that solves a unique problem. Yes, sir? Could be. And why would we have them in different things? Because 
your chemical, a bicyclic catalyst, is going to catch. Could be. In an elegant way, fixing things that are specifically in this case, and you say, see if there's anything wrong. Nothing was wrong, I'm just going to strong believe it. So you would rather have the expression of uh, parallel or not parallel just basically be like a global property? It just depends on what it just depends on. So if it doesn't have a dependency, it can go ahead and run? That's the way bicep works. If I don't have any dependency, you run things in parallel. And then you're going to be more strongly towards the bicep, right? Yeah. I don't see any reason why we couldn't. I mean, I could test this now just using the parallel group. Um, so I don't see any really reason why, if, if, that's the, if that's a cleaner model, we couldn't explore I'm, I'm just, not needing the group. I, I see a kind of a harmony between how natural resources are deployed to the bicep and how these are deployed. These are individual resources. This is just natural resources. Yeah. Lots of different I like that. But the behavior should be the same. The same as the way the arm engine works. Yeah. No need to kind of recreate something and. I like that. Things are already there somehow, right? I don't know. Yeah. Really yeah. Completely there. Oh, but like the concept should be the same thing. Like if I don't have any dependency, being invisible or explicit, then run things in parallel. See if it's not I like that. Right? Yeah. If I need to have that, then I will set my dependency. Okay. In the same way as okay. Uh, I will also create an issue for that. I mean, the, the thing is that if we have already a lot of people writing bicep files for untempered dependence, right? Why they need now to relearn things just for doing this? Wouldn't it be better that they can just reuse the knowledge they already have and expectations that they have for deploying bicep, altering bicep to kind of I apply to this? I, I think the real value of where you're getting to is the behavior of the ARM engine. Like the, the bicep expression as a language, uh, I could, it, we, we could adopt that, right? I think the real argument you're getting to is um, have it behave like Azure Core when it handles deployments, not in a way that's different or else your expectation is gonna be off when you're trying it for the first time. Okay, that's cool. That's really good feedback. Uh, Pre-test, and this will be a good one for feedback too. Um, we have the concept of, okay, in DSC v1 and v2, if test fails, you run set. Um, we have a concept of being able to turn that off. So we can say implements pre-test false, which tells the engine you don't have to run test before you run set. This is an anomaly. I just always want you to run set no matter what. There's some scenarios that have come up where that was needed, um, so we added it. Not as big of a reaction for that one. <laughs> uh, the schema um, is, is an extension. So whenever you, remember we've always had schema.moth, and in your resource that you wrote, uh, if it was script-based, if it was class-based, your schema was your parameters for your class. If you're script-based, then you had the schema.moth that was a moth file that said, these are the available properties for that resource. Here's our description, here's our type. Um, the idea is if you're describing a resource as a JSON manifest, at the end of it, so this is like scrolling down to the bottom, uh, there's an expressed schema that says, here's the additional properties for the, man for, for the resource. So um, here's the list, list of proper parameters that are being input, their type, uh, is it expected to support or output any properties that are not listed here for flexibility um, and additional metadata that, that, that will continue to grow over time? The whole point of this basically is to get rid of the schema.moth file that was accompanying those resources and just have that expressed in the same manifest that tells it what to run and how. Uh, almost out of time, but we're, we're close. Um, one of the things we're looking at, because there's a bunch of scenarios now, especially in the, the developer type scenarios, where it needs to be invoked in the user context instead of in the system context. So instead of running a system where you've got root access and you can do anything you want, if you're running as a user because you want it to, to uh, 
interoperate, to, to interop with your local desktop and you want it to go install applications or change some Windows settings and things like that. Now your context has changed. Now we got to deal with UAC. So the whole idea of having a security context section in the metadata was uh, within your configuration and even more granular if needed, you should be able to say, run this normal user context, now elevate, run it in this user context, and then we'll have to figure out like what's the user experience during that. So is it like running and then it prompts UAC and you approve and then it goes back to running and then, because there's actually some applications that can't run in UAC, we found, uh, they're installers. So this will be interesting to work through, uh, but it's a completely new uh, idea. And then timeout, we kind of had this before in the extension for DSC, but this is just the basic section uh, in the metadata that says for this config or for, for this group or for this resource, if it runs more than this number of seconds, then kill it so the machine doesn't just sit there and turn forever in some loop. Um, just give it a basic timeout operation. So the, I know we're about out of time. The two demos I wanted to show just to show compatibility and like Steven said, the great thing about predictors is you just pull them right up in history. Um, so this is just an example of, it's, it's basically invoke DSC resource, but it would be calling DSC resource get. Um, and it's specifying, so DSC resource get, I should run DSC.exe first and let's take a look at the um, overall experience. But it's telling it to call PS desired state configuration slash file. It was just saying, here's a destination path, go look for C colon slash test dot text. And then there's the normal file input. Um, and the, the real difference here was in V2, file didn't work at all. Yes, sir? Yes, uh, and binary. So that, that's the big thing that I was showing here is that um, right now, those are the three types that I have expressed for. PowerShell, so binary only works for the Windows PowerShell because I'm running it in five. Class and MOF um, or, or script both work in, yes. And then the other one was everybody's favorite and the one they hate the most, which was the original script resource. Um, so in this case, my get script is just running get content for that same file. I didn't bother implementing uh, set or test. And uh, I'm just telling it to go ahead and run DSC resource get, but output JSON. And then, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, in fact, I should be able to. Yep, you got it, yep. Yes. In fact, let me run another tab. Oh. I'll come back to that. So if I just run the DSC executable, that's what the output looks like. Um, this is the most current build as of this morning. Um, and so you can see it can generate a completion script. So in PowerShell, you could do tab completion by registering that as an autocompleter. Uh, this is how you would pass it in. So you can say DSC config, um, and you can actually run even for a configuration get set test. Uh, the last one I'll show here. And then we'll follow up in GitHub or in the community call or whatever. Uh, so this was, Using Rust, it's calling uh, basically get DSC resource. A couple of the things you'll see that are interesting here. So first of all, obviously, all of the original resources there, including file, log, and signature validation that are binary type. Uh, but there's this new column, which is capabilities, expressed here as caps to make it shorter for the column. So GST is get, set, test. And if it supports exports, if it supports uh, validate, that kind of stuff, it actually is an expression for the capability. So the way I've got it now is, for all of the original stuff in the gallery, it just defaults to get, set, and test. But if you wanna publish a new resource tomorrow that only implements get and test because you only care about audits, you could actually see that as you're going through your list of resources. So we're out of time, but I'll come over to you. Oh yeah.